All right. Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight. I'm Hannah Hodge with Springfield Community Gardens, a nonprofit based in Springfield, Missouri, whose vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy and local food. This workshop on produce food safety is generously supported by the BFRDP grant from the USDA Office of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Our speaker tonight is uh, MU Extension Horticultural Field Specialist and Produce Food Safety Specialist, Pat Patrick Byers. And I'll let him introduce himself further in just a moment. Um, some housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions throughout the night, please ask as we go. Um, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or type in the question uh, during the presentation and we will stop periodically to chat with Patrick about them. There is a, there's also a chat feature at the bottom of the screen. Please only use this for comments that help me track the questions throughout the night in regards to uh, subjects in which they pertain. Um, and thank you to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. We really appreciate it. Um, also, once you leave this workshop, a screen will pop up with a link to the post workshop survey. This survey is used in Springfield Community Gardens reporting to the USDA and also helps us provide meaningful workshops in the future. We would appreciate if you would take a few minutes to fill that out after this workshop. If you would like to refer to this workshop later, it will be available on Springfield Community Gardens Agricultural Workshop Playlist on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. I'll put it up in the link as, I'll, I'll put the link up in the comments as well as the website and social media. And tonight's exit survey in the chat in just one moment. Um, and that's it for me. So thank you all for being here tonight. And now I'm going to hand it off to Patrick. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to be with you here tonight, and Hannah, thanks for for uh, sharing the uh, the program with me tonight and keeping me straight and keeping keeping all the uh, the uh, questions and, and chats in, in in order. I'm Patrick Byers. I'm a horticulture field specialist with the University of Missouri Extension, and I'm based in Southwest Missouri. And uh, much of my appointment is focused on profitability and sustainability for specialty crop farmers, fruit and vegetable farmers. But I also have an appointment in produce food safety. And anytime I'm invited to do a presentation on produce food safety, I immediately volunteer because it is so important. And it's, it's important that, that everyone who is involved in our food system have a commitment to, to, to food safety. And that includes certainly farmers, but it also includes marketers and, and it includes consumers as well. So any chance that I can have to participate in that, that uh, awareness, I'm, I'm happy to do so. So I think at that point, let's go ahead and bring up the presentation. Okay, Hannah, can we see the presentation? Yes, that looks great. Okay, very good. And, and as Hannah mentioned, uh, if there are any questions moving ahead in the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A. We will stop regularly through the presentation to tackle any questions. So please feel free to type them in and we'll definitely make time to, to, to tackle those questions. I do want to acknowledge the partners for tonight's presentation. Hannah mentioned it, I'll mention it as well. First of all, Springfield Community Gardens. This is a grassroots community-based organization that has a vision where everyone has access to healthy local food in our community. Uh, the USDA is also involved, as Hannah mentioned, uh, through their generous funding of our programs. And then of course, University of Missouri Extension is the third partner in this, this presentation. Well, what are we gonna talk about tonight? So this is a quick overview of produce food safety. And obviously we, we really can't delve into excruciating detail with produce food safety in our time together, roughly our, our 90 minutes tonight. I wish I, that we could, because as I said before, very important subject matter. Um, but we will, we will talk about all of these topics tonight and hopefully they will generate some questions among those of you in attendance and we'll tackle those questions. Please feel free to also reach out to me at any point uh, following the presentation if you have any questions related to produce food safety. My contact information was on the title slide. It'll also be on the closing slide. So first of all, we'll talk about why we should be concerned about produce food safety. Then we'll talk about what can make you make you sick, quite frankly. And, and it's a kind of a sobering uh, statistic when we realize that one out of four people are going to get sick every year based on something that was on the food they ate. 
So again, if you're if you're with a group, look to your left, look to your right. Probably one of you is going to get sick sometime in the next 12 months because of something that you ate. We'll talk about site selection. We'll talk about hygiene and health. We'll spend a bit of time talking about water and irrigation. Then we'll talk about soil, manures, and compost. We'll talk about animals, and then we'll talk about how to handle crops at harvest and post-harvest. I do have some action items for you tonight. Again, as Hannah mentioned, there'll be an evaluation that pops up. These evaluations are so important to, to me as a presenter. Uh, by reading your, your, uh, your honest input, it helps me become a better presenter, it helps me do a better job of sharing this information. So I really appreciate your participation. And as Hannah mentioned, um, we are required through the terms of our grant to report back to the USDA on our programs. And your help will be, will be much appreciated with that as well. The Produce Safety Alliance website, anyone who has even a passing interest in produce food safety needs to be aware of the Produce Safety Alliance. This is a, a national organization that is focused on all things produce food safety. Check out that site. It's hosted at Cornell University. If you're involved with the community garden, I highly recommend the North Carolina State University Community Garden Food Safety website. And here is the, uh, the link to that. I want to mention that if you are, are serious about produce food safety, as I mentioned tonight, we'll be introducing produce food safety, but we have an excellent program coming up June 21st and June 23rd, 2022, this year, uh, next June, this coming June, actually. And this is a Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Alliance training. This will be an eight-hour exposure to produce food safety, much detail, valuable program. If your farm is subject to the produce safety rule, this satisfies the requirements for, you, for your training. So please feel free to join us. The uh, registration site is, is listed here as well. And as I mentioned, moving ahead, if you have any questions regarding produce food safety, please reach out. I'd love to visit with you further. Okay, first of all, let's talk about why we should be concerned about produce food safety. Again, one out of four Americans will get sick each year based on something that they ate. This is uh, 76 million illnesses. 325,000 hospitalizations, and regrettably, 5,000 deaths per year. And to be honest, these numbers are actually an underreporting because the, the symptoms of foodborne illness frequently mimic the symptoms of other types of illnesses. And there are many, many, many illnesses that are not attributed to the correct source, which is foodborne illness. If we look at some data from the Food and Drug Administration in the period of time from 1996 to 2014, it's interesting to see which produce items were implicated in foodborne illness outbreaks. And if we look at this pie chart, <clears throat> we'll notice that there are two groups, uh, sprouts and leafy greens, that are uh, responsible for nearly half of all reported uh, foodborne illness outbreaks. But we can see there are lots of other slices to this pie, melons, tomatoes, berries, Herbs, cucumbers, and, and, and others are all, all been associated with foodborne illness outbreaks during that period of time. And notice too that there is a section called unknown. So nearly 5% of foodborne illness outbreaks were never traced back to a specific produce item. Quite frankly, the uh, agencies that focus on, on identifying foodborne illnesses and minimizing the impact of foodborne illness outbreaks are, are somewhat like. Uh, uh, a CSI, like a crime scene investigation, where they're looking at all of the data that is at hand, trying to figure out what caused the problem and how widespread the problem is. And unfortunately, there are a number of cases where we know it's a foodborne illness, but it's never traced back to the particular produce item. But again, looking at this part, the, this pie, notice that there are lots of slices, lots of different produce items that have been implicated in foodborne illness outbreaks. Now let's take a look at, at produce. You know, why is produce a problem? Why are we focused on produce food safety tonight? Well, there are many types of produce that we eat without cooking. We enjoy eating things such as berries and, and leafy greens and, and, and apples and tomatoes and many other types of produce without cooking. Eating raw produce is healthy, it's delicious, it's something that we enjoy doing, but we have to recognize that anytime we eat something that is not thoroughly cooked, there is a risk. You know, if, if, if every piece of uh, produce that you ate was cooked, the risk of foodborne illness would be much reduced. But we do like to eat fresh, uncooked produce. And oftentimes the produce that we grow is in close contact with the soil, and the soil can be a source of contamination. So again, thinking back to that pie chart, the reason the leafy greens have been implicated in 
in so many foodborne illness outbreaks is partly because they're grown in close proximity to the soil. But other things such as summer squash, strawberries, root vegetables, and spinach are also crops where, where uh, the, the, the part that we consume, the part that we enjoy is growing close to the soil. Well, can we just wash the produce? Is washing a good idea? Well, yeah, certainly we can wash produce, but research and experience has taught us that once produce is contaminated, it's very difficult or even impossible to clean that produce up. And again, there, there are a number of reasons for this. Oftentimes produce, because of its, its physical configuration, has places where con contamination can lodge. If produce is bruised or damaged, contamination can actually become internalized and it can be very difficult or impossible to clean that up. This is why when we focus on produce food safety, we take a preventative approach. Our goal is to prevent contamination. Now, contamination with, with microbial pathogens, you know, when, when can it occur? You know, oftentimes we, we think about, oh, you know, all of this happens out in the farmer's field. And indeed, contamination can occur in the field or in the garden. It can also occur anytime a hand touches that produce. So for example, during harvesting and handling, it can happen anytime a produce item contacts a surface that might be carrying contamination. So in distribution, sharing, sorting, and it can also of course happen in the home when the consumer takes it home and is preparing it for consumption. So anywhere from the garden to the fork, contamination can occur. We have to focus on the entire chain from the, the farmer, the garden to the consumer's fork. Now, frequently, um, I've had the opportunity to work with urban farms, and so I like to include information in these presentations that is somewhat specific to farming or gardening in urban areas. And so if we look at a community garden or an urban farm, there are several things that are unique to this setting compared to a farm in a more rural area. Frequently in this urban setting, there are lots of people involved. There's leadership, there's volunteers, there's plot holders, the community can walk through the garden at large, and having lots of people involved is definitely a significant risk. We also frequently have free access of animals to these gardens. And certainly it can be, be invited animals such as pets or domestic animals, but we also have wild animals and we have feral animals that can access gardens and farms in urban areas. Frequently, we don't have as much control over activities in these areas as we do in a rural area on a farm. And then there's unknowns as well. And this particularly relates to things such as previous uses of the site, which we'll talk about here in a moment, and, and also activities by neighbors. In urban areas, there's always neighbors, right? And so activities going on in a neighbor's yard can impact the safety of produce grown in an urban farm or a community garden. Now, when we talk about produce food safety, we frequently use the term good agricultural practices. And basically good agricultural practices are common sense approaches to risks. There are things that we can do to reduce the risk of contamination to food. And by following these good agricultural practices, we can ensure that the produce that we, we enjoy from our gardens or that we market to consumers is safe. And, and of course, it's also a, a protection for you in the event of an outbreak. If you're a farmer and you've done due diligence and you have in place plans to reduce the risk of produce food safety, or, or foodborne illness related to produce production, this becomes your defense if there's ever an event of an outbreak. And again, as I mentioned before, it's important that all of us, certainly farmers and, and those growing produce, but also those handling produce and consumers as well, share a common set of attitudes, values, and beliefs around food safety, okay? I always like to point out that when we talk about a community garden, we're talking about lots of things, right? But there needs to be a community food safety culture as well. So again, it's important that all of us uh, take responsibility as we can to growing and handling and, and marketing and consuming safe produce. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Hannah? Not at this time. Okay, please, as I, I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, enter them into the, uh, the Q&A. Okay, let's talk a little bit about contaminants and the things that can make people ill. So first of all, we, we, we tend to focus on biological contamination when we talk about produce food safety. And obviously that's not the only source of problems, but it is a big concern. And so we have to be thinking about biological contaminants. And these are frequently, in fact, in almost every case, contaminants that come either from people or animals. And you've seen these names before. You've heard these names if you follow 
uh, foodborne illness outbreaks, but, but pathogens such as E. coli, Cyclospora, hepatitis A, listeria, norovirus, salmonella, shigella. These are all organisms that if you consume them, pathogenic forms, you can become ill. And so we, we, we oftentimes think about these first. Now, as I mentioned, these come frequently from people or from poop. So poop is certainly a source of, of contamination. And it's because um, animals and people can shed these organisms in their feces. And so things such as uh, manure sources or animals that might be present in a garden or a farm or people who have not been practicing good hygiene can all be a source of contamination. People who are ill can, can contaminate produce with, with problems such as hepatitis or norovirus. And then contaminated water can be a problem as well. You know, water is very effective at, at spreading contamination and taking small limited problems and, and spreading them into a much wider area. But of course, there are non-biological contaminants as well. Heavy metals, we'll talk more about that here in a moment, but especially lead and arsenic. And in many cases in urban areas, we can have problems with heavy metal contamination in, in soils. Petroleum distillates. So again, things that are, that are uh, uh, materials such as uh, gasoline or, or uh, uh, exhaust uh, debris or, or other things that come from petroleum, oil. Pesticides and fertilizers. There can be physical contaminants, glass, trash, metal pieces, uh, wood pieces, all of these things. And then there can be other stuff too that, that uh, oftentimes is, is, is hard, to, hard to believe, and, but, but can become a problem. And we've seen again, outbreaks of, of, of situations that are related to some of the most bizarre contaminants. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Hannah, about the contaminants? Um, not that I see at this time, but feel free to submit a question in the Q&A if anyone does have any questions. Okay, let's talk about site selection. And a very important aspect of minimizing risks associated with, with foodborne illness is choosing a good site, a site that just because of its characteristics is not prone to contamination. All right, let's talk a bit about sites. So whenever possible, try to learn as much as you can about the history of the site that's going to become a farm or a garden. In rural areas, oftentimes it's pretty straightforward. You know, it was an area that was in pasture for 30 years and now I want to grow a specialty crop. Or, or perhaps it's an area that was in some sort of row crop and now I'm going to convert that over to fruits or vegetables. It can be trickier in urban areas because oftentimes the, uh, the uh, history is much more complex in an urban area. You know, a particular lot or a particular site in an urban area may have been four or five different uses over, over the years since it was, it was first uh, uh, settled. And sometimes it can be a challenge to identify what those uses were. But learn as much as you can about the history. And oftentimes this will give you some clues as far as the suitability of the site for gardening. May also give you some clues as far as what you wanna look for related to contaminated soil. Uh, risk of flooding, if it's a lowland area or an area that has evidence of past floods, this definitely is a red flag. Is it an area that's used by animals? Do you see animal tracks? Do you see poop on the site? Do you see other evidence that animals are regularly present? And what about the, the activities that are going on around the site? Are there livestock around the site where you want to grow fruits or vegetables? Are there waste disposal facilities? Are, are there other things going on that might impact the safety of what you grow at that site? And again, this is early on in, in uh, the, the process of establishing a farm or a garden. It's very helpful to call in assistance, to call in other eyes, to look at the situation and to give you an opinion. And then of course, as we'll see here in a moment, there are things that you can do to help understand the characteristics of, of a particular site, you know, even before you plant the first vegetable or, or fruit. So a bit more about the history of the site. How do we learn about the history of the site? Well, we certainly talk to previous owners and especially if it's a long time or a long-term owner, they can be very helpful in understanding what a site was used for previously. In urban areas, you can contact planning officials. Uh, it can be helpful to ask community members, uh, you know, talk with the neighbors, talk with the, uh, the uh, uh, extension agent who has responsibility for that area. And then of course, visit the site and evaluate potential risks. That it's, Quite frankly, it's, it's, uh, it's not a good situation where a person purchases a piece of property without doing a site visit and evaluating potential risks. Very important, very important. 
then let's get a soil test. And certainly the soil test can tell us lots of information about a potential site. You know, uh, a, a standard soil test looks at soil pH and it looks at nutrient content and, and it looks at the uh, texture of the soil. And that's all in, uh, useful information from the standpoint of growing crops, but a heavy metals test is indispensable for understanding any risk that might be present at the site related to heavy metals. The uh, University of Missouri Soil Testing Laboratory can conduct the test. Uh, the uh, test fee is $50 plus a setup fee of $25. So it's helpful if you have uh, several uh, tests that you want to run at the same time. The setup fee is only charged once for a group of samples. And a typical MU soil testing lab heavy metals test will test for arsenic, cadmium, cobalt, chromium, molybdenum, nickel, lead, and selenium. Well, so what does this heavy metal test really tell you? Well, here's an example of two heavy metal tests that were conducted recently in Springfield. And this was a site that was a, a community garden site. And you can see sample one and sample two there on the, the left side. And then as we read across, we can see what the various test levels were at that particular site. And frequently, the heavy metals amounts are reported in, in terms of milligrams per kilogram of soil. Now, this is helpful. You know, these are the levels in the soil, but what does it really mean? Well, first of all, we can look at what are called background levels. And there are many heavy metals that are just naturally present in soils at some level. And typically it's a fairly low level and typically it's not felt to be uh, a risk at these, these background levels. So for example, if we look at, at arsenic, the background level is three to 12 milligrams per kilogram. If we look at something like um, uh, nickel, so nickel is 0.5 to 25 milligrams per kilogram. And we can compare the background level to the actual test level. So we can see in, in, in most of the cases here, our uh, soil test levels are at or below the background level. Now there are some that are getting kind of close. Nickel is a, is a good example. And another good example is arsenic. So these are two uh, red flags. They're not at a level that precludes using this site for, for gardening, but they're still uh, something we want to keep our eye on. Now, of special concern is lead. And looking at uh, lead levels, it's helpful to look at the EPA levels where the EPA recommends remediation of sites. And I could only track down four of these levels, and they were for cadmium, chromium, nickel, and lead. But let's take a look at the lead level here. The EPA recommends uh, addressing problems at or above 400 milligrams per kilogram. In our test, both of them came back with lead levels higher than that. So obviously, this is a point of concern. Well. Again, what does this tell us other than, than we need to be concerned about lead levels? But we can look further and there are resources available that help us understand what these levels mean. And for example, the uh, Pennsylvania State University has a, a useful publication on understanding lead levels in soils. And according to this publication, if the lead level is less than 150 milligrams per kilogram, there's no concern from the standpoint of using that site for gardening. If the levels are between 150 and 400, we're advised to follow best management practices to minimize lead exposure. Well, what does this mean? Well, this means gardening in such a way that we don't actually come into contact with the soil, especially children. And what this typically means is if you have levels that are, are at the levels that we saw in our tests here, that we're going to put down landscape barrier fabric in the paths between garden beds. And then the beds themselves, we're actually going to place raised beds. And we're going to place soil into the raised bed that we bring from outside the garden is not contaminated. And that's where we'll actually garden. We can still use the site, we just can't use the soil. If we see levels higher than 400, 400 to 1,000, we have to be very cautious about leafy greens because leafy greens, again, can, can uh, uh, because of their close proximity to the soil, can very easily become contaminated with lead-borne soil. And if the level is above 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, we should not use that site to grow a vegetable garden. So again, we would not know what these levels were if we had not done a heavy metals test. So very important to do this heavy metals test in advance of planting the garden. Now, what can we do to lower the safety risk? Well, first of all, we wanna be sure to store all pesticides and fertilizers in a secure fashion so that it, they don't become contaminants of the garden or the farm. And this is obviously very important when children are present. If we do choose to use pesticides and fertilizers, use them only as indicated so that we can minimize any potential for contamination of crops. 
and make sure that we follow all label requirements. And of course, we want to wear protective equipment if needed when applying any of these chemicals to, again, to protect ourselves and our health. Okay, do we have any questions related to site selection? Uh, not at this time. Okay, very good. Well, now let's turn our attention to hygiene and health. And hygiene and health is a, a very important area. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, foodborne illness has been traced back in many cases to poor hygiene, to people who had contamination on their hands because of poor hygienic practices or because of illness. And so we'll spend a few minutes talking about hygiene and health. I start off with this, this um, newspaper article, and this is from a number of years back, actually in 1992, but it was a case where there was one person who was uh, ill with hepatitis A, and because they worked in food service, they exposed an estimated 15,000 people. And again, these, these people basically had to go uh, receive health care because of this potential exposure. And again, uh, this situation could have been eliminated if, first of all, if good hygiene had been practiced, and, and secondly, if this person who was ill obviously had not been working with fresh produce that was then consumed by, by others. So again, it is a serious situation. You know, something as, as basic as good hand washing practices has huge, huge implications when it comes to managing the risk of foodborne illness. Is hand washing important? Of course it is, of course it is. If there was one practice that we all did and did well and did frequently that would reduce the risk of foodborne illness, it's hand washing. And granted, we've heard probably more than we, we want to hear about hand washing during the uh, recent pandemic, but we should be washing our hands all the time, all the time. Again, 50% of foodborne illnesses are related to poor hand washing, and that is very sobering. Now, when should we wash our hands? Well, the bottom line is frequently, but here are some specific times when hand washing is particularly important. After using the toilet, before or after treating a cut or a wound, after smoking, eating, or drinking. The risk here is that your hands are close to your mouth, and if you have contamination in your saliva, it's, it's quite likely that your hands will become contaminated. After handling compost, after handling garbage or plant debris, after caring for or touching animals, any time before you handle produce, and then any time that your hands are soiled, they should be washed. So again, we should be washing our hands frequently and regularly. Now, how do we do this? Well, you know, again, if we're in a, in a situation where we're close to a bathroom facility, that's pretty straightforward. But if we're in a production field or someplace that is somewhat distant from a, a permanent facility, it doesn't mean that we can't develop a good process for washing our hands. Basically, all we need is potable running water, you know, running water that is drinking water quality. We need soap, we need single use towels, and then we need something to catch the wastewater in and some sort of a trash receptacle to place the towel in. And again, you can see in this lower picture here, it can be, it can be made at home. All this is is a barrel, a trough. The trough drains into a second barrel. There's a soap dispenser and there's single use towels. And then right there in front, you can, you can see it there if you look closely, is the trash receptacle. We can also purchase uh, a portable hand washing unit as we see there in the upper right picture. Now, again, we've heard, uh, we've heard a lot about hand washing during the pandemic, but it's remarkably interesting how few people actually adequately wash their hands. And I've, I've done exercises with, with audiences where we all take time to wash our hands, and then we, we use a, a process using a material called glow germ and a black light, and we can very quickly see the areas of hands that were missed. And if we look at this diagram, anything that is in red is areas that are frequently missed. So certainly we look at our thumbs, this is an area that is regularly missed. We look at the ends of our fingers. Very good practice to have a, a nail brush in place to scrub your fingernails and the ends of your fingers. And then uh, it's not apparent in this diagram here, but frequently wrists are missed as well. So again, the process for washing your hands, and forgive me, but I have to say it, wet your hands with warm water, apply soap to your hands, lather your hands briskly for 20 seconds. Focus on your palms, focus on the back of your hands, Focus on your fingers and your thumbs. Scrub your forearms. Use that nail brush on your nails. Make sure you do both hands. Rinse thoroughly. And then paper, use a single-use towel to dry thoroughly. And then, of course, dispose of the towel. Research 
uh, time and again has demonstrated that if you lather for less than 20 seconds, it's not good enough. So 20 seconds again, say the alphabet to yourself twice, sing happy birthday twice. What about hand sanitizers? Goodness knows how many millions of gallons of hand sanitizer were used during the uh, pandemic. But hand sanitizers are not a substitute for hand washing. For sanitizer to be effective, hands must be clean to start with. And so always wash your hands first before using sanitizer. Sanitizer is an extra step. It's an extra bit of risk management, but it does not replace hand washing. What about gloves? Can they replace hand washing? No, they cannot. So if you're going to use gloves, that's fine, but your hands need to be clean going into the gloves. So make sure that you wash and dry your hands before putting on the gloves. Make sure that you use the gloves for a dedicated tasks. Gloves tend to make us careless. Gloves can very quickly become contaminated, and then the glove can be a very effective way of spreading problems. So be cautious when using gloves. And then when you take gloves off, wash your hands at that point as well. Cross-contamination, we need to mention this as well. And cross-contamination is the transfer of harmful substances or disease organisms to the, the things that contact food, the things that contact produce. So again, it could be a utensil or a tool. It could be a food contact surface, such as a tabletop or a sorting table. It could be equipment. It could be uh, anything that contacts produce. It could be a harvest container. It could be a transportation bin. Anything that contacts produce, if it's unclean, can move that problem, that contamination, onto the produce. So again, very important to always be thinking about reducing the risk of cross-contamination. Now, how do we lower the safety risk related to, to health and hygiene? First of all, of course, best practice is to wash your hands with soap and clear water, dry using single-use towels. Uh, if you don't have running water available, be very cautious, okay? Be very cautious. Again, it's better than nothing to wear disposable single-use gloves, but again, none of this is a substitute for good hand washing. Now, another thing that needs to be pointed out, if you're ill, don't work with produce. If you're losing any sort of bodily fluid, if you're sneezing, if you're coughing, if your nose is running, if you have diarrhea, if you have any sort of, of bodily fluid loss, don't work with produce. If you have a fever, don't work with produce. If you don't feel well, don't work with produce. Okay, any questions about health and hygiene? Not at this time, but feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom if you do. Okay, let's talk about water and irrigation. So again, as far as the source of contamination, water is right up there at the top, okay? And part of the problem is that we use water to grow crops, we use water when we harvest crops, we use water when we handle crops, and we use water at home as well. And if there are any issues with the quality of that water, it can be very simple, very, very easy to transfer these problems onto produce. So again, water quality is very, very important. Now, one way to, to think about the risk related to water is think about where the water is coming from. So if you're in a garden or a farm setting and the water that you use comes from a public water source, such as a county, a city, a municipal source, uh, uh, some sort of, uh, of a public agency that distributes water, this is the safest water. And the reason it's the safest is that water is regularly tested, and in many cases it's treated to eliminate any microbe load that might be present in it. So public water is the safest. If you're, you're drawing your water from an area below the surface of the soil, uh, groundwater, a well, for example, this tends to be safer, but it doesn't mean that it's safe, okay? Uh, the only way to understand if groundwater is safe is to test it. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. Surface water. Surface water is almost universally contaminated to one level or, or another. The reason is because it's open to the environment. It's open to many different sources of contamination. And so surface water is typically the highest risk water from the standpoint of, of potential contamination to produce. So again, know your water source. Where is the water coming from? Before you plant the first crop, understand the, the characteristics of your water source. Uh, if you're using an unregulated source, such as a river, stream, irrigation, ditch, uh, those sorts of things, those carry risk. Wells carry risk, and if you don't test the well, you really can't say with any certainty that that water is safe. Be very cautious about collected rainwater and rain barrels. Uh, the uh, 
rainwater that is being collected in these systems comes from a surface. And that surface, in most cases, is open to the environment and open to contamination. It's been our experience as we've tested uh, water sources, uh, water samples drawn from many different collected rainwater sources. Again, almost universally, they carry some load of contamination. Another risk factor is how we're using that water. And frequently, when we think about water use and crop production, we're talking about irrigation. We're talking about using that uh, water source to meet the water needs of a crop. And anytime we apply that water in a way that it wets the part of the crop we're going to harvest, that carries a risk with it. Typically, the, the riskiest way to irrigate is with overhead or sprinkler. And if we look at that upper picture, we can see water being distributed through a sprinkler. It's being thrown over the crop. The entire crop gets risk or gets wet. And again, unavoidably, the water is contacting the produce that at some point we're going to harvest. Flood, which is surface or furrow, carries less risk. Frequently, this water doesn't contact the harvested part of the crop. Again, the exception would be red vegetables. But an open irrigation source, such as a flood surface or, or furrow, can carry the risk of splash. And again, water can splash out of these systems up onto the crop, and that def definitely carries a risk. The safest method of irrigation is drip. Drip, trickle, subsurface micro, or under canopy, these are all ways the water is applied directly to the soil. And if the system is properly uh, designed and properly maintained and properly operated, the risk is very low. Now, the exception, of course, is, is root crops because unavoidably the water is going to contact root crops. But combining a drip or a trickle system with uh, a mulch layer, such as we see in the lower picture, a plastic mulch layer, uh, it would be an unusual situation if that water were to somehow splash up onto the crop. Now, again, things happen, irrigation lines break, uh, uh, in, inadvertent contamination can occur. So they're not completely without risk. But in general, dripper trickle is the safest, overhead or sprinkler is the riskiest. The, a good adage is the less contact with water, the lower the risk. And so again, when we think about crops and, and how we grow them and, and how we handle them at harvest and, and, and all of the steps along the way, anytime we can eliminate a step where the crop gets wet, this is a good risk management practice. So again, if we're using a, a direct water application method, uh, such as uh, a sprinkler, the risk is high. If we're using uh, a, an application method such as drip or trickle where we don't directly apply it to the crop, then the risk is, is low. Patrick, we have a question. Yes. Uh, Connie Kirkpatrick asks, so roof water collected should only be used by drip irrigation? So roof water collected is again, almost universally carries some load of contamination. So my first thought there is to test that water to get a feel for what that contamination load is. And then if you're going to use it, you know, again, be aware. Uh, there are some guidelines, which we'll talk about here in a moment, as far as the amount of contamination that, that may or may not cause problems. It's a good practice to, to use it in a drip or trickle setup where that water will not directly contact the crop. Now, again, if you're growing rich vegetables like carrots or, or radishes, then, you know, that that's contact is expected in that setting. But yes, we, we cannot assume the collected rainwater is safe. So test it and then use it in, in such a way that you minimize risk. Awesome, that's it on questions. Okay, so some more thoughts on irrigation water. As we get close to harvest, it's a good idea to switch to a potable water source, a water source that is drinking water quality. Uh, you know, if you have access to, to city water or county water, Typically, it's expensive, and I understand why there might be a, an interest in using a well or some other source, but as you get close to harvest, you might consider switching to that drinking water quality water. This is very helpful in lowering the risk of contamination to the crop at that point where you're going to harvest it. What about washing produce? Uh, again, any time you're going to wash produce after harvest, the water must be drinking water quality. Uh, it's an extremely dangerous situation when you're using water that carries any load of contamination at this point. And the uh, Food and Drug Administration rec has recognized this by putting into place what's called the Produce Safety Rule. One of the, the aspects of the Produce Safety Rule is the requirement that all water used at harvest and post-harvest be drinking water quality. Another important thing to think about is how many times you're going to use that water. You know, yes, it may start out at drinking water quality, but if you use that same tub of water all day long with batch after batch after batch of produce, uh, 
at some point contamination is going to be introduced into that water. So using that water just once is the best approach, okay? If you are using that water for more than one batch of produce, then consider using a sanitizer. And there are lots of different sanitizers that can be placed in the water. Make sure that you, you read the label carefully and you only use sanitizers that are labeled for use on produce. Okay, there are lots of sanitizers that are not labeled for use on produce. And if they don't carry that label and you choose to use them, you're breaking the law and you're also introducing a risk of, from just using that material. So check the labels carefully, make sure that they are labeled for use on fresh produce. And then make sure you use the right amount. And if you're gonna do this uh, routinely, why don't you buy some of the uh, test strips that are used with different sanitizers? And then once you mix up your tank of water, dip a test strip in, make sure that the color change uh, uh, demonstrates that you've added the right amount of sanitizer to get the job done. Okay, so what can we do to lower the safety risk when we think about water? First of all, whenever possible, let's use a regulated treated water source, okay? If we're using a water source that is, is clean to start with, we greatly reduce the risk from, from irrigation. We have to use drinking water quality water for washing produce. We have to use drinking water quality water to wash our hands. And it's a good practice if you're applying chemicals to use a, a uh, drinking water quality source as well. If you plan to use another source such as a well, test the water. Okay, there's lots of, of good resources on how to properly test water. I will mention that here in Missouri and Kansas as well, we have a program in place that will cover the cost of testing your water if you're using that water for produce. And uh, for more information on that, please reach out. Uh, at, at this point, uh, the, the program allows you to test as many times as you'd like. And it's a good practice with well water to test that well water routinely to make sure that there is some sort of contamination source that is getting into the well water. I know this from personal experience. I have a well that I plan to use for uh, uh, sweet potato production. And I tested it at the beginning of the season this year and lo and behold, it came back with contamination. I tested it again, it came back with even more contamination. So I'm not planning to use that particular well as a water source for, for my garden. And then again, consider using drip irrigation. This is by far the safest way to apply water to a crop. Okay, do we have any additional questions on water and irrigation? Not at this time. Okay, very good. Now let's talk a bit about soils, manure, and compost. As I mentioned at the very beginning, soil can be a source of contamination. That contamination frequently comes from manure or improperly treated compost. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about this. Now, we, we do recognize that, that animals and, and humans too shed pathogens in their manure, in their feces. And one of the, the things that's interesting is we really don't have a complete understanding of how long these organisms can survive in that manure after they've been shed by the animal. We know that it can be at least a year, sometimes longer, but no one knows precisely how long, a, for example, a, a pathogen might survive in manure after it's been applied to a garden or to a field. So we tend to take a very conservative approach when it comes to reducing the risk associated with using manure in, on farms and in gardens. Um, we have what are called the National Organic Program Standards. And this is sort of the, 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 the standard that is being, being recommended at this point to reduce the risk that's associated with, with manures. And for high-risk crops, those crops with, that might come into contact with the soil or the manure, we need to allow 120 days from when that manure is applied before we harvest the crop. With lower-risk crops, we can frequently do a shorter interval. 90 days is what's recommended. Now, what would be a high-risk crop? Well, something like leafy greens, perhaps, or strawberries, or root vegetables. A lower risk crop might be something like trellised um, cucumbers, or staked tomatoes, or blueberries, or, or apples. A, a crop where the part that we're going to harvest is separated by some distance from the soil. I know many farmers who, who just routinely follow the 120-day interval with, with all of their crops to give themselves a little bit of added protection from the standpoint of this particular risk. Now, a good question uh, when you think about soil amendments, is it manure or is it compost? Well, this is a, this is a valid question. You know, am I applying something that carries a risk? In general, if the compost has been produced with a scientifically validated process, 
where the, the when we'll talk more about this here in a moment, but where the raw materials were thoroughly mixed and they were allowed to compost up to a, a threshold temperature and they were kept at that temperature for a long enough period of time, the composting process can eliminate many pathogens. On the other hand, if that compost was not produced with a proper process, or if the compost is contaminated with, with raw manure, then the risk is much higher. If what you're applying is straight manure as it comes from the animal, that's when the risk is highest. So it's important that if we're applying compost, that we understand how it was made so that we can say with assurity that it carries little risk. Now, how do we define manure? Well, manure includes certainly raw manure collected behind an animal. It also includes that pile of manure that's been sitting out behind the barn for a year. It includes manure slurries. It includes compost teas that we've made with raw manure. And it includes, quite frankly, any soil amendment that comes from an animal that is not treated with a scientifically valid process to reduce pathogens. So again, this is, this is a pretty broad definition. And unless manure or animal products have been through a process that eliminates these pathogens, we have to think about these things as carrying risk. And we definitely want to think about the 120 and 90 day intervals. Now, what is it that makes compost safe? Well, first of all, if the raw materials come from plants rather than manures, that's generally a, a uh, uh, the, the compost that results is a safer product. If it's a commercial compost, in many cases, commercial compost is produced under standardized conditions, control conditions, it's generally safe. If we produce compost on our farms or in our gardens, then we have to be concerned about the actual process. Again, in, in, in many cases, we're not able to meet those minimum requirements that ensure that that compost is actually microbially safe. And if we can't say with certainty that, that that's the case, then we need to treat that compost, even though it's been through a composting process, as we would treat raw manure. So here's what those composting processes look like. And as, you, as I, I read through these, think about if you have compost at home, think about your, your uh, process. And, and, and if it meets these standards, then there's a good, uh, a good possibility that your compost is safe. But if it doesn't, then please treat that compost as if it were still raw manure. The two approaches are static composting and turn composting. So with static composting, a pile is created, and then uh, the uh, pile is kept in an aerobic decomposition state, and then the temperature is recorded within the pile, and we have to have a minimum of 131 degrees for three consecutive days, and then we put an insulated blanket over the pile and allow it to the process, the composting process to continue until it goes to completion. We can also turn compost and speed up the process. Again, it's an aerobic composting. In this case, 131 degrees for 15 days, and we have to have a minimum of five turnings. And then we, we also cure that then with proper insulation. Now, these conditions can be met on farm or in the garden, but you have to be able to show that you've met these conditions. Because if there's ever an issue related to contamination from your compost, unless you can show this, this you know, the, through your records that this has been indeed the case, that you've done the compost properly, then there's a good chance that the contamination came from your compost because it was not completely decomposed. It had not gone through a process that eliminates microbes. Now, if your compost is safe, there's no restrictions in terms of days between application and harvest. It can be applied up to the day of harvest. Um, again, if you're growing leafy greens, you wanna be cautious even with, with, uh, with safe compost. And it would be a recommendation not to apply safe compost close to the day of harvest on leafy greens. What about locating your compost pile? Well, as the compost process is taking place, there is the possibility of organisms leaching out of that pile and onto crops in the garden. So try to keep the pile away from the garden or the field. Try to keep it downhill to reduce any runoff problems. Uh, try to keep unfinished compost out of the garden, again, because it carries risk and watch out for compost contamination. Uh, community gardens, a common situation is to, to have a pile of safe compost, yes, but then feral cats get into it and they, they poop in the pile and, and you don't see the poop because they bury it. And then suddenly the, the pile is contaminated because of the activity of the feral cats. So it's a good practice to cover finished compost piles to exclude 
uh, accidental uh, compost contamination from the activity of animals, especially feral cats. Okay, so lowering the safety risk. Uh, a good practice is to put the compost pile far away from the garden or the farm. And then again, it, to make the assumption that on-farm composting that includes manures will not produce a microbial safe product. Treat it as manure. Don't harvest at-risk produce within 120 days of an application of manure or on-site compost. And incorporate compost in the, into the soil as soon as possible after application. Incorporating it into the soil hastens the decomposition and also hastens the die-off of any organisms that might be still present in the compost, harmful organisms. Okay, any questions about soil, manure, and compost? I don't see any. Okay, now let's talk about animals. And uh, the, the, the subject that we just passed, uh, just finished up, you know, manure and compost, obviously is tied in closely to animals because animals can, can present a risk of contamination by their activities in the garden. Frequently, what we're talking about here is, is pooping, but the presence of animals can also lead to contamination from their bodies, their saliva, from their feeding activities. So we'll, we'll expand the discussion a bit. So, Feces are the primary source of problem related to animals in, in the field or in the garden. And we want to be very cautious about animals that are present in areas where produce is being grown. And we certainly want to watch for evidence of animals. We're going to be very vigilant looking for, for poop, for manure, but we're also going to be looking for tracks and evidence that animals have been feeding on our crops. We have to recognize that it can be a challenge to keep animals out of production areas certainly to keep animals out of a community garden, out of a garden, out of a field. You know, we can make a good effort. We can put up fences or scare tactics, but even so we have to be very vigilant to look for evidence of animals being present in areas where we're growing crops. And this is especially true as we get close to harvest. So again, try to keep wildlife out of gardens and farms as much as possible. Some of the strategies are fencing. There are repellents that can be used, scarecrows, there are uh, trapping or lethal methods that can be followed, but again, before trap using trapping or lethal methods, it's very important to get the uh, proper permits. In Missouri, it's the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, it's a similar agency in, in, in other states. And again, before you, you attempt to trap a problem animal, you have to do it legally, and so you'll need the proper permits. But again, they're, they're wildlife that, that can become a problem. Pets can be a problem as well and so can domestic animals. I've been on many farms where chickens have been given free reign, and this can be a dangerous situation if the chickens end up in produce fields, okay? Try to keep your pets out, dogs, cats, other pets. Uh, keep them not only out of the garden or out of the production field, but keep them out of the place where you're handling produce. I've seen so many situations where cats have been sitting on tabletops, and then that same tabletop is then used to grade or, or, or sort produce. So again, unless you clean and sanitize that tabletop, there's a risk there related to cross-contamination. So keep your pets under control. Keep them away from produce fields as best you can and keep them out of the areas where you're going to handle produce. And then again, keep that compost bin covered so that you exclude animals from the compost pile, especially, especially cats. Okay, so how can we lower the safety risk when it comes to animals? Again, let's use a fence. Uh, fencing can be very effective with many animals. It's not obviously absolute, but it can be a, a helpful way to keep animals such as deer out of production areas. Keep your pets out of the garden or the field. Keep your pets out of areas where you handle produce. Make a good faith effort. You know, do the best that you can. Try to, to prune back areas where birds might perch within a production field. Use repellents or scare tactics. Use fences. All of these can be helpful. A very important practice, and I'll mention it here with, with some emphasis, is to scout the garden of the field immediately before harvest. Obviously, the closer you are to harvest, the more dangerous contamination is. So before you harvest, do a walkthrough and look carefully to make sure that there's no contamination of produce from poop or from the activity of animals. And not only you, but train everyone who's gonna be out there harvesting to keep an eye out. And if you see evidence of contamination, that area needs to be marked. The uh, Food and Drug Administration does not allow produce that's been visibly contaminated with feces to be used as food. So be very cautious 
when, when you have evidence that animals may have been in a field. If you see evidence, tracks and such, then you wanna be very vigilant looking for poop. Okay, any questions on animals in the garden? No questions at this time. Okay, well, let's wind up with some thoughts on harvest and post-harvest. And again, we can do a fabulous job of growing crops. We can be very vigilant from the standpoint of looking for animal contamination. We can have uh, uh, clean, clean harvest containers. We can have all the things that go into growing crops safely, but then we can mess up at harvest and post-harvest. So again, it's a very important time to focus on on produce food safety. So some thoughts on harvest. First of all, try to pick your fruits and veggies dry. This is, is important from the standpoint of the quality of produce, but if you do inadvertently miss a piece of contaminated produce and it's wet, it's more likely that that contamination will then end up on your hands and then your hands will spread it to other produce items. So try to pick produce in a dry state. Discard produce that has bird droppings or manure on it, okay? And it's also a good practice to discard produce in the vicinity of animal manure. You know, for example, if, if, uh, if the, the neighbor's uh, pet pig gets loose, you know, let's say they have one of those miniature pigs and it gets loose and it ends up in, in the garden or, or in a produce field. And uh, when, when pigs poop, they keep walking. And so you, you can have a situation where you might visibly see contamination, but it's likely there are other contaminated pieces of produce around where you visibly see the initial deposit. And so it's a good practice to discard some produce in the area around it. Now, how far out do you need to go? Well, the, the, the laws don't really tell us that, but you're expected to use your common sense. And a good practice is to consider an area about three feet in diameter around where you visibly see uh, contaminated produce. Keep in mind that at harvest and post-harvest, all water must be potable. Make sure that you keep your tools, your harvest totes, your storage totes cleaned and sanitized. Well, what does this mean? Well, when we talk about cleaning and sanitizing, this is a four-step process. So we always clean first and then we sanitize. Cleaning means, first of all, rinsing a surface. Secondly, applying a detergent or a soap. Third, scrubbing it using some vigorous activity, then rinsing it, okay? And now we're ready to sanitize. But again, we have to follow the, the, the cleaning process first. When we sanitize, then we spray a sanitizing solution of the proper strength on a cleaned surface. I remember uh, working with a group of middle schoolers talking about produce food safety. And I just talked about you know, cleaning and sanitizing. And then I asked the young people in their own terms to define what cleaning and sanitizing meant. And, and one student I thought did a really nice job. Um, she said, well, cleaning is getting rid of what we can see. And then we go back and we sanitize to get rid of anything that we can't see that we might've missed. And she was exactly right. That's why we clean first and then we sanitize. Make sure that the surfaces that we're going to put produce on, tabletops, countertops, uh, the bins we might be putting produce in to go back into a cooler, make sure that those are clean and sanitized as well. Uh, it's a good practice from the standpoint of maintaining the quality of produce is to, to deliver it promptly or to use uh, cold storage promptly. You know, these are very important from the standpoint of maintaining quality. And then again, it is so important that anyone who's going to touch produce follow proper hand washing pra uh, practices. Okay, they, they obviously should understand how to hand wash and they should be using proper technique. And then it's important obviously to provide facilities so that people can properly wash their hands. Some thoughts on harvest containers. Um, if we look at this picture here, we can see a number of different types of containers that are used for harvesting produce. And if we start in the lower left, we see a plastic tote. And these are, are, are they're, they're good. They're made out of a material that can be clean and sanitized. Now, these are a little bit tricky because you'll notice there are lots of ventilation holes. And it, it can be, you've got to be dedicated to getting these clean. You'll be using a scrub brush to get into all of those crevices and open areas to make sure that the entire tote is clean when you clean it and sanitize it. The uh, buckets that we see in the middle are commonly used for harvesting produce, and these are excellent because it can be easy to clean and sanitize. It's also easy if you're using a light colored bucket to see evidence of contamination. Now, how frequently should you be washing and sanitizing these? Well, it's a good practice to do it on a set schedule. Lots of farmers wash them once a day, but you need to have in place a plan in case they get dirty in between routine washings. You know, for example, if you're picking zucchini, which sheds lots of sap and debris, or if the produce has some soil on it, you may need to wash and sanitize the picking buckets more regularly. 
what about harvesting into paper bags, what, like we see in the lower right? Well, a paper bag, if it's new and never been used before, can be used for, for one, one harvest. But it's impossible, obviously, to clean and sanitize a paper bag. So these should not be used multiple times. What about those cardboard containers that we see in the upper right picture with, with the uh, tomatoes in? Well, if these are clean and, and uh, initially they can be certainly used for harvesting, they could possibly be used for more than one harvest. But again, the minute that these become soiled, they should be discarded because they're made out of cardboard. And again, it's hard to clean and sanitize cardboard. What about the plastic bag that the, uh, the young lady in that upper picture is holding? Well, certainly plastic bags can be used for handling produce, but it's very important that they be, be clean bags to start with. It's very dangerous to reuse bags because you really don't, never know for sure what was in that bag before you place the produce in it. It could be something that carried some load of contamination. And then when you place produce in it, that produce can become contaminated. So certainly plastic bags can be used, but they should be uh, clean new bags at the start and they should be used just once. And again, the picture in the, the upper right there shows a number of different produce items that are placed in bags. And this is just fine as long as they're they're, uh, as I said before, they're, they're new bags and they've never been used before. Okay, so what about the areas where we're packing and sorting? So oftentimes on farms, we have permanent facilities. They might be open and we can certainly use open structures, but that's a bit risky because birds can fly into these areas and, and uh, insects and rodents typically have free access to, to open packing areas. So enclosed structures are certainly better as far as excluding problems such as birds, rodents, insects, keeping pets out and unauthorized people. What about portable pack areas? Sir, por portable pack areas are just fine as well. And I've seen lots of setups where people are using uh, plastic surface tables where they, they set them up and place produce on those surfaces and then uh, grade it, sort it, perhaps in some cases rinse it off as well. But make sure that if you're using portable surfaces that those surfaces can be adequately cleaned and sanitized. So for example, a plastic table works great until it becomes scratched and scarred and, and has areas that are more difficult to clean and sanitize. Wood top tables, they're a challenge from the beginning. And if you're working on a wood top surface, it's a good practice to coat that surface with something that is practical from the standpoint of cleaning and sanitizing. And again, we wanna put special attention to any surface that contacts produce because again, any surface that contacts produce can, can present a risk. So make sure that the surfaces that you're using can be easily cleaned and sanitized. Now, again, to, to reinforce cleaning and sanitizing, you notice the last bullet, let's watch a video. Um, I'm not gonna do that to you tonight, but I will say, first of all, that if you're going to use a sanitizer on a surface, such as a tabletop or a bucket or, or a counter, make sure that the label says somewhere on it that that sanitizer can be used on a food contact surface. And this is different than contact with fresh produce. There are some labels, for example, that will allow use on food contact surfaces, but have no mention about using it on fresh produce. So make sure that you use the uh, sanitizer appropriately. Now, again, just to reinforce the process, first of all, we clean the surface or the tool or the container. We remove visible soil with a, a rinse, then we wash with detergent and potable water. Then we rinse again, and then we use a sanitizer. For example, a food grade bleach is commonly used and, and a rinse of 50 to 200 parts per million will do a very effective job of sanitizing the surface. And that's roughly one teaspoon to one tablespoon of bleach per gallon of, of potable water. Good, good practice to have a test strip to dip into that gallon to make sure that the, uh, the bleach is effective and then you could certainly use that. But again, there are good resources out there to help you understand cleaning and sanitizing. And if you have any questions, please reach out. I'd love to visit with you about that. What about storage? Well, it's very important to have places to store the appropriate things that you're gonna be using on the farm. And these should not be in a common storage area. So for example, if you're storing chemicals, don't store chemicals close to your food containers. Don't store chemicals close to, to harvest containers. Have a dedicated area for chemicals, such as pesticides or fertilizers. Have a dedicated area to store your tools. Have a dedicated area to store your harvest containers. Uh, if you have cold storage, make sure that your cold storage is secure. I remember a situation several years ago when I toured a farm and they were actually storing fertilizer in cold storage next to produce and uh, just such a, such a risky situation. 
So again, keep your produce separate from any other storage and then keep things such as your harvest containers and uh, your harvest tools in areas that are separate from chemicals. So what about damaged produce? What about produce that's been bruised or punctured or, or, or otherwise damaged? Well, anything that breaks the surface of produce, you know, a, a tear in a lettuce leaf, a, a stem scar on a tomato, a bruise on a peach. These are all places where pathogens can enter into a crop. And so we wanna use proper harvesting and culling to, to help with, with our issues related to produce safety and quality. For example, the uh, produce safety rule, again, one of the, the, the FDA rule that governs fresh produce does not allow you to, to market produce that's been dropped. So for example, if you're harvesting uh, blueberries and you spill a bucket and it falls under the ground and the blueberries go rolling out and, and uh, at that point, it's assumed that those blueberries are contaminated. And so that bucket of blueberries cannot be used for human food. So be very cautious about uh, handling produce. And if produce is dropped and damaged, then it should not be, it should be culled. It should not be used for, for food. What about moving produce? Well, here's a, it's kind of a straightforward situation where this gardener is moving produce in a wheelbarrow. Well, this is just fine, but let's think about what else that wheelbarrow may have been used for. Perhaps that wheelbarrow was used to to haul off uh, uh, waste leaves and things after sorting produce. Perhaps that wheelbarrow was used to haul a load of manure into the compost area. Perhaps that wheelbarrow was used to carry someone's dog around. All of these potential uses of that same wheelbarrow could have led to contamination. And then when produce is placed into it, that contamination can spread to the, the produce. So be very cautious about equipment and vehicles that you use to deliver produce. Try to figure out what was used the last time. If you're loading it into a trunk and you see evidence that there's a lot of dog hair in there, there's a possibility that a dog might have been in that trunk. And that area needs to be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized then before produce is loaded into it. If you're using a pickup truck, take a quick look at the bed of that truck and make sure that it's in a clean condition because we don't want to, to ruin an entire load of produce because that same truck was used to, to haul chicken litter away. So be cautious about the vehicles and the equipment that you're using to transport and move produce. Now, there could be situations where it can be hard to adequately clean and sanitize the surface. And if that's the case, let's say this wheelbarrow is a good example, uh, and, and it's all scratched up inside, and there's, there's bolt hole uh, heads where the, the parts are attached, and it's hard to clean it and sanitize it. Well, let's put a layer between the produce and the wheelbarrow. Let's put a tarp there, for example, that's clean and then put our produce on top of the tarp. We've put a barrier between a potential source of contamination and the produce. Okay, so some thoughts on washing produce. Uh, you're, you're never required to wash produce. There's no federal law that says you have to wash produce. And in fact, as I said earlier, anytime that you can avoid contacting produce with water, that is a risk management practice. But if you do wash produce, use potable water only, okay? Immediate use, yeah, certainly it can be washed. <clears throat> if you're going to be delivering produce and you don't have to wash it, then don't wash it. It can be helpful in a setting such as a farmer's market or something like that to mention to your customers that the produce hasn't been washed and it's probably a good idea when they get home to wash their produce. But you are not required as a farmer or a gardener to wash produce. Okay, so how can we lower the safety risk? Well, some of the things we can do, we can wear single use gloves when we're harvesting, that helps keep produce clean from the standpoint of health and hygiene. Make sure that we're putting our produce into clean containers. In the case of paper, cardboard, or plastic, those should be single use, or it should be a container that can be clean and sanitized, such as those plastic buckets that we saw earlier. Make sure that hands are washed before harvesting and make sure that the hands are washed whenever they're contaminated. Do a thorough scouting of the garden or the farm before harvesting. You're looking for manure. You're looking for evidence that there could be a problem. Make sure that work surfaces, tools, and equipment are cleaned and sanitized. Make sure that your transport equipment and your vehicles are clean as well. Okay, do we have any questions at this point on uh, harvest and post-harvest? We don't have any questions, but I do. Um... I was just wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on vinegar, washing your produce in vinegar? 
So I don't see any problems with using vinegar. Vinegar is not a particularly effective sanitizer, particularly when we're going after pathogens like E. coli or salmonella. But I don't think that's going to cause any problems, and it may certainly be helpful against weaker pathogens. But I wouldn't rely strictly on vinegar to, to solve issues related to produce contamination. Do you think that the use of vinegar can uh, cause the produce to age faster? You know, Hannah, I don't know that I know the answer to that. Um, anytime that we expose produce to, to chemicals, there is that risk, certainly, that it could speed up the, the, the respiration or the sort of the, the processes that lead to the degradation of produce. You know, anytime that we harvest a piece of produce, we have to recognize that that produce is alive at that point. And our goal is to keep it alive as long as possible because that's how we maintain quality. So when we harvest produce, we try to harvest it when it's dry. We try to harvest in the morning while it's cool and the, the produce is, is thoroughly hydrated. We try to handle it very carefully as we harvest it and transport it. We try to minimize the exposure of that produce to things like water and chemicals, perhaps such as vinegar. We try to cool it as soon as possible. And then we try to eat it and enjoy it as soon as possible. Those are all parts of maintaining the quality of produce after we've harvested from the garden. Awesome. Yeah, there are no questions at this time, but uh, everybody feel free to use the Q&A if so. Yes, and so um, here are the several resources. These are the same resources that I mentioned earlier. The Produce Safety Alliance website, just a wealth of information there on produce food safety. Food safety in the community gardens, that's that site from North Carolina State University. And then the Kansas State University Produce Safety page. And this includes uh, uh, information on, on where to register on our various food safety workshops, including the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Alliance training that's coming up in June. So check out all three of these sites and you'll find a wealth of information related to, to growing, handling, and delivering safe produce. Okay, well, at this point, this is the material that I wanted to cover tonight. And again, here is a chance, if you have any questions, to please put them into the Q&A. And uh, Hannah and I will stay with you as long as you have questions to ask. And then when, when we finish up tonight, as Hannah mentioned earlier, and as I mentioned as well, there'll be an evaluation that comes up and we, we so value your input. So please take just a few minutes and fill that out for us. So do we have any questions at this point, Hannah? Uh, we don't have any questions, but Rachel Pendergast says, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. And again, please reach out if you have any questions related to produce food safety moving ahead. My email is, is here on the, uh, the uh, uh, screen. So please feel free to email. I, I, you know, I'd love to visit with you about produce food safety. It's so important, so important. Do we have any other questions coming in? Uh, none at this time. This is a great workshop. Thanks so much. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, again, moving ahead, please reach out if you have any questions. And Hannah, I think at this point, we can, we can conclude the workshop. So thank you all for joining us. All right. Have a good week.